Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the Australians in the past team, particularly Jocelyn Le Tourneau, who organised this conference, but all of the group, um, for their extraordinary generosity and friendship and scholarly collegiality, which has permitted us to um, exchange ideas over the life of the Canadians in the past project, and I hope will continue in the future. Uh, I begin with a reference to my abstract for this address, which uses, uh, is framed by an English and a French historian. Um, I began with E.H. Carr's book, What is History?, published in 1961, um, uh, and to the book, What is History For?, that was published in 1978 by Jean Chénault. It illustrates very clearly, I think, the beginning of the shift, asking questions about the nature and the purpose of history across that time period. For it was Carr who opened up the Anglophone world to the notion that interpretation is the central core of the historical project and the selection of facts a conscious choice of the historian. He, in a sense, he laid bare the craft. Um, and Chénault, in the French-speaking world, and Anglophone later when it was translated, who was one of a number um, of historians who by that time were arguing against history for its own sake. And his book is partly an attack on the Annales School. He thought the historian should consciously produce the history that serves the political aim of the historian's ideology. His, which was Marxist or, to be more precise, French Maoism, or more importantly for our purposes today, he argues that the past has meaning only in relation to the future. Both of these men were witnesses to the various events in the long and catastrophic 20th century, and they were both intellectuals who succeeded in having a very public political role in various capacities of their time. Uh, Carr was more involved in diplomacy, but uh, Chénault became president of Greenpeace in France. Both brought the role of the historian in society into the spotlight as a visible force in the making of history. And they introduced a renewed self-consciousness about the role of the historian. Now, it's only 30 odd, 35 years since Chénault wrote that book, What is History For? And we have had such a vast changes in the intellectual landscape since that time, it is hard to imagine today writing a Marxist tract arguing for the purpose of history to affect a socialist revolution. <laughs> Many of us now feel that it is difficult to sustain this assumption that history should be written and studied for its own sake. And that was very much the rhetoric of the past, as some of us were training. And it has very different purposes now, in a plural sense, in the second decade of the 21st century. But let's be clear what we are talking about here. I am referring to history as a university-constituted area of study, which some regard, in a cynical way, as just the byproduct of the higher education system. If you ask historians who reads your books and articles after they finish, which students read your books and articles after they finish university, there is generally a silence. For it is usually others in the higher education system who read these works. <clears throat> That's fine. In the higher education system, as Chad so clearly shown us, history is not alone in the important changes to the notion of the purpose of the humanities. And again, you referred to this in your talk. Certainly in the Anglophone world, um, we are facing some very strange contradictions in the humanities and social sciences. Um, where the explanatory power of the old rhetoric about the uses of the humanities um, is losing its force. 
in the face of increasing corporatisation of universities and the promotion of an entrepreneurial ideology which focuses on economic rationales, um, where there are new forms of managerial governance emerging and ideas of accountability holding sway in a variety of guises. Historians in the academy are part of this climate. The pressure to justify their existence, its usefulness, and um, some of the old arguments about the con what I'm talking about, about losing explanatory power, are some of the old arguments about the uses of humanities for society, for social benefit, all of which are problematic in some way or another for um, enlivening the imagination, etc., etc. They're not working, basically, <laughs> um, or not very well. Uh, so, one effect is to see the blossoming in Europe, England, and as well as the United States, Canada, and Australia um, of public history programs as the answer to this. But there is no doubt that there is a crisis of humanities and social sciences in the humanities and um, in the academy, sorry. The resulting possibilities are either very unsettling or exciting depending on your point of view. Because we now know from our surveys, and we will see from this conference, just how varied and rich is the range of histories, historical activities and memory work being done outside the universities in the public domain, outside the sphere of influence of historians. Developments within the history disciplines since then, in universities, have underlined this. So we have seen that the, the wider domain of ideas and assumptions about the past have been claimed for historical study, so that the historian's customary ground, and that's why we're all here today, the boundaries of acceptable historical analysis has shifted. Um, it, we have new methodologies, new objects of study, and the definition of what counts as a legitimate source and an acceptable subject is more and more broadened or called into question. We have the impact, again as Chad showed us very clearly, of interdisciplinary analytical languages. The, the whole notion of, for example, literacies, which is only a recent phenomenon. Um, so we talk now about historical literacies, we talk about methodological literacies like visual literacies, media literacies. Um, which we are helping students to obtain. What that's done is help us recast our perceptions of how the past carries meaning in the present, um, pointing us all to the subtle and disguised ways that history gets evoked and addressed in the culture. Depeche Chakrabarti notes that in the last five to six decades, historians have come under pressure to incorporate and represent the pasts of different groups, hitherto marginalised and excluded from it. In almost every case, this gives rise to the question of whether the distinction between testimony or historiography should be dissolved in the interests of challenging the authority of the historian. It's a dis discipline now attempting to accommodate multiple perspectives, and it is um, Chakrabarti, who was one of the first people in his book Provincialising Europe, who, taught, who led us to understand the concept of history as a Western notion, as is all of those who work in post-colonial nations with indigenous peoples. Um, so, outside the universities, um, I just before I, I just want to respond to something that Chad said about the Canadianisation, if you like, of history, the emergence of the Canadian history profession, which is, is paralleled in Australia. But it is quite interesting that at this time, in, at this moment, um, the profession itself is doing very well, but there is a decline by students in the study of national history. So, and in fact. In Australia, I don't know what's happening here. History departments are being decimated because students are not taking Australian history. 
um, their mandating history in uh, national syllabus at, at schools, but they're not doing it at university, can't mandate at universities. So there's an interesting trend, in turn, and I, I think it's to do partly with how students understand their identities. Um, anyway, we can take that later. But outside the universities, there are different ideas and images of the past, as we all know, that circulate through the mass-mediated public sphere and the boundaries between the popular ideas of the past and the discipline of history have become increasingly porous, thank God. Central to these have been the transformation of the infrastructure and the modalities of publicness itself. And we don't have time here to go into what's one of the most prevalent uh, issues, which is the role of emotion and affect in public life has increased extraordinarily. Um, it would be hard to avoid the massive and overwhelming salience of all forms of memory work, remembrance and commemoration, gathering pace since the 1980s. And the public interest, which exceeds the professional academic development of memory studies and saturates large areas of entertainment, popular culture, and commercial exchange. Commemorations, as we have seen, invest some events, like the anniversaries of war, with extraordinary significance. Yet some sites and uh, events struggle to be recognised. Memory Now We Know offers a crucial site of identity for people under what might be called the contemporary condition. That is, the, fee, the fear of the extent and speed of change. Jeff Ely, who's an English historian who works in the United States, um, argues for uh, the narrating and visu visualising the present as history. Um, he talks about promising a surrogate architecture of continuity. So memory is a way of deciding who we are and positioning ourselves in time and space, I would argue. Um, and it's, I've been looking for ways to understand what came out certainly in the Australian survey, which is this increased desire to connect to the past all the time through the range of historical activities. Now, Ely's calling this a surrogate architecture of continuity. Um, Given the enormity of the structural changes now and that are so palpably and destructively remaking our world in the present, and of course I'm talking about you know, the new information technologies, um, <coughs> etc. In this way, we are all being invited to participate in making a different historical sensibility and shifting in our responsiveness and receptiveness to the past as a field of meaning. Well, in what way? Um, let's get a bit concrete. Um, I've got three small examples here which help us to think about the ways in which our historical sensibilities, our sense of living in time and space is being reconfigured, which owes almost nothing to historians. Um, my first is a little story that I love, <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't show it to you. Oh. Uh, F5. 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 Mm. Thanks. Okay, this is called The Gap. Um, it's in Sydney. I'm bringing a little bit of Sydney to Canada. Um, behind the gap, this faces the ocean. Behind the gap is the whole of the five million people of Sydney. Um, but the gap is the little, the little bit in the, uh, of the inlet, if you like. And this is the story of Nellie Bishop. I'm going to tell you a little story. Um, and this story emerged in the Sydney media in uh, this a couple of, a month ago, in August and September. 
It's a very specific local story. That's why I'm giving you the picture of the place. Uh, the Gap is renowned in Sydney and probably the most of Australia as a place where people commit suicide and are occasionally murdered. Um, but huge numbers of people use it to, uh, <coughs> to kill themselves. Now, in 1923, Nellie Bishop was a, um, a woman who was... Um, engaged to a soldier who had been off to the First World War, but he returned injured with injuries and Nellie discovered that they were unable to have children. Now, her greatest wish in life was to have a huge, large number of, you know, a big brood of kids. And she didn't know what to do. And, and, and of course, she loved this man. Uh, there was no solution. She didn't want to leave him. Her life seemed impossible. So she jumped off the gap. But what happened was, um, the dress she was wearing, usually you jump off the gap to the rocks and fall on the rocks below, but the dress she was wearing operated like a parachute. This is a lovely little story. And she <laughs> floated down into the sea. At the same time, two Italian fishermen, um, this is in 1923, two Italian fishermen saw her fall into the sea and came and picked her up in the boat. Now, Nellie Bishop went on to live. That's a 19... She went on to live, um, left her soldier, married another man, and had eight children. Um, <laughs> and all of her descendants are here today. This is Nellie before she, when she died in 1988. And that story was essentially lost to us. It was left within family memory. And what happened was that Nellie, it's kept in the family, but some of Nellie's relatives sent her story to a popular historian who's very well known in um, Sydney, Australia, called Peter Fitzsimons. And he published it in a, um, a magazine. And he had this extraordinary response from people. It just touched a nerve. And it was picked up uh, by other media. It was um, sent to... Um, it, it, it got onto television. And what happened was that the media then... Um, he, he put the story in the magazine and other media picked it up. It appeared on the 7.30 report, which is a news magazine type thing. Um, a letter appears in the... Um, so he told half the story from the family. I've told you the whole story. And then a letter the next month comes from the Italian fisherman's descendants. <laughs> so... Um, so the story then comes full circle. And the television program um, uncomfortably puts the members of the families, the generation descendants, together. And they all say, yes, we're going to keep in touch now. <laughs> and, <laughs> but I thought it was a, it's a beautiful story to, tell, to, let, to see how the media negotiates pub, a moving memory from <clears throat> a personal story, in a sense, into the public and mediates between the generations. But it also it is a story that has circulated previously in the media, so they could look up the history of it. OK. So um, that, that, touched, that story touched a huge number of people, and it was told in journalism circles as a story about, here is hope for people who want to commit suicide. There is always you know, there is always a way out. And Peter Fitzsimons, the uh, popular historian, is calling, is calling for a plaque to Nellie um, to be put at the gap, but uh, people are resisting because it might induce others to try and suicide or try and survive. Um, <laughs> um, I notice that there's, suicide is also an issue from the Globe and Mail in Canada, uh, youth suicide in particular. So... In, in the journal, the way the story is told and comes to light is very much about um, 
it has, an, it has what the journalists call an angle, a twist. Um, so <clears throat> that's my first little story, which uh, I think very clearly shows that negotiation. My second story is just a quick one. Um, sorry. This is a, this is a oh. <laughs> sorry. Uh, sorry, I don't know how to bring up the hyperlink. Anyway, I won't worry about it. Um, the, sec the second one is a, is a Google engineer who sets up. A pro he sets up a project called Mapping the Fallen. And this project um, uh, shows every single soldier who has been killed in Af Afghanistan and Iraq in every country, um, uh, both their, where they've died in Afghanistan and Iraq and then where they come from in coalition countries. And he's mapped it on a digital map, uh, England, Canada. <clears throat> we didn't get to see much of Canada. It's made, you know, and the map of um, the United States, which is absolutely covered. So it's where these people came from, where they were killed. Um, there's an individual. You click on the map, and there's an individual history of each person. What this shows you, needless to say, um, although this. Um, Mapping the Fallen project um, maps everyone who's been killed from the coalition. It mentions that there are numerous people killed in Afghanistan and Iraq, but there is no information on them. So it's very clearly a project which attempts to create an international community in countries which have been engaged with the war in, the, in these countries. Um, and in one sense, it was important for me to talk about it because it's about the way memory representation has its limits, the way memory scapes can be uh, crossing the national, and also about the way um, what, what you would see if you saw this website is that the time is flattened in it. Um, the, each person is individuated, but you, you don't get a sense. You get a sense of the scale of the deaths, but not um, the time across which this has been happening. So although there are references to the many more Iraqis and Afghanis who have been killed, there, it is very much a project about the coalition forces. Now, my third example is this... Uh, Is, is this memorial. And it shows something completely different. Um, this is about space and time in a different way. Andreas Hewson discusses the way in which we all come into constant contact now with other cultures through movement, immigration, etc., although we're in close proximity. Groups fundamentally remain separated uh, as they carry with them the memories of conflict and incompatibility with deep historical roots. Um, animosities that are rooted in imperial domination, religious conflict, etc. The urban environments of today's cities are haunted by the destruction and trauma of the 20th century and reveal the unsettled state of those who experience dispossession. Now, this is a monument <laughs> depicting the Assyrian Christian genocide carried out at the same time as the Armenian one was, um, <clears throat> which the Turkish community, uh, we, we also have a commemoration of the, of the Armenian genocides and the Turkish community have a history of contesting that. This one was set up <coughs> quite recently. Um, of course, there were politics between state authorities about it. Um, but the local council 
um, made a decision to approve a memorial funded by, of course, the, the Assyrian Universal Alliance, despite the opposition of other parliamentarians and politicians um, and the Turkish ambassador to Australia. Now, this is, this is set up in a suburban reserve, um, in a place called Bonny Rig, which is an outer suburb of Sydney. It's a sculpture by a guy called Louis Batros, and it depicts the hands of a martyr draped in the Assyrian flag with figures of children at the base. It stands 4.5 metres tall, and it's a memorial set up, guess what, to be noticed. It's asserting its emotional power in the landscape. Um, unsurprisingly, not long after its completion last year, in, on August the 7th, the memorial is vandalised and painted with a Turkish crescent and star. These activities probably tell us more about people building and opposing the memorial in the present than the people and the past being commemorated. But the incident very clearly demonstrates how much versions, different versions of the past in memorial form stand against each other in public arenas. And that the emotional grip of history still matters to, you know, as we all know, to ethnic identities and religious identities who live thousands of miles from the original context, who are competing for recognition and legitimacy. It's not surprising that the encounters, the conflicts and, and the um, contests between diverse memory practices and the emergence of new orientations towards the past are played out in public and thus become what we all know as the negotiation of public memory. Not only are these contests related to memories that help constitute different publics, but the struggles often revolve around whose memories will be made visible and in what ways. Now, I've talked about the history discipline constituted in universities, and I've talked about memory work that is being done in the broader society. I haven't deliberate, I'm not splitting memory and history here in oppositional sense, um, or an inside-outside ac academy, you know, outside academy dichotomy. I know that this is a much more complex process. Um, but the three examples I show here reveal very clearly that the replacement of history with memory and commemoration is the primary description of our current conception of the past. It reveals our relationships to the past have fundamentally changed. Um, I think it is not simply a temporal change. I think it is also to do with scale. But the historians who have written about this talk about it largely in terms of time. But the very reason I showed you the Nellie Bishop story was because sometimes the little intimate stories, those little small-scale stories, produce, evoke different kinds of responses uh, from people. So, and I believe scale is important. If you'd seen the large one about, you know, the Google project um, about the people who have died in the coalition, you know, you're immediately distanced from it. You are depersonalised as Susanna Radstone would say. Um, so they have a very different impact, I think. Um, and the most important thing that's happened in relation to memory and history is, of course, that memory collapses the traditional distance between the present and the past. And uh, I think, as uh, Henri has, has already indicated, um, he's a contemporary historian and I trained uh, in modern history and when we uh, began our training one never worked in history beyond 1945. It was the resilient cut-off point for contemporary history which was largely originated in political science but none of us ever did anything <laughs> past the Second World War. Um, so there's, that's meant that there is a very different thinking about this question of how we are distant or close to events. So that 
Um, I remember when we used to uh, discuss sources, we were told that you, that you couldn't trust an eyewitness <laughs> and um, we shouldn't study events in which we are very close to, uh, to them or, or, or accounts where people are very close to events because they were completely unreliable. So it was the scientific historian who kept the distance and that was part of um, being critical. Um, Mark Salber Phillips, who's a wonderful Canadian historian, has talked about this question of distance. And he says, and I quote, every form of historical representation must position its audience in some relationship of closeness or distance from events or experiences it describes. Since there is no universal or privileged best position, he is now saying, the world has changed, no, there is no fixed stance in distance or proximity. We have to decide where we want to, which position we want to be in to view events or experiences from. Now, Francois, Francois Hartog, which again Rousseau referred to, is an historian who has baptised these changes um, um, as an awareness of time and the constructed character of our distance in time from an event or a closeness to it. And as uh, Rousseau's already indicated, he called them regimes of historicity, elaborating on Kosselec's analysis of changing modes of experiencing the past since the 18th century. And for those who didn't understand the French, um, uh, Hartog's um, Judge that the new regime, the new regime of historicity, is since 1989. It's a presentist regime. Um, so previously, our understandings were largely from the point of were teleologically understood largely from the point of view of the future. Um, they are now no longer. They are much more concerned with being in the present. With, and one of the trends you see in both popular history and academic history is, is a focus on experience and a focus on reliving the past, immersing oneself in the past. Um, and people want to get as close to the experience of it as possible in the present. Um, I don't know whether Hartog does, but many historians have located this shift to the present uh, connected with the nation state um, so that national history is regarded as no longer the custodian of history and memory partly because it is continually being contested. How much time have I got? Um, perhaps I won't go into uh, too much uh, how talk. Um, what we have, though, um, is the growth in concern about the nation amongst historians, particularly since the beginning of the, the 80s and on, is related very much to time and has become a problem in Western historiography. While for some, it's putatively a solution, certainly in Eastern Europe, and in South Africa, though, of course, we know there are huge problems with that. The recent crisis in nation building in many Western countries, unable to integrate mainly Muslim immigrants, um, has resulted in attempts um, by a variety of constituencies, agencies, etc., um, to use history education to create, to tr attempt to create unity in the society um, and a considered belief in the salutary practical effects of national history education has not changed um, and we have just introduced <laughs> a national mandated um, history syllabus in Australian schools just as they have in Holland and you know in the Netherlands and a range of other countries Denmark etc etc um, one of the things that interests me about the historians who've been writing about this turn to presentism is uh, that we've noticed in both the academy and outside the academy 
is that um, they don't see this um, as, a, as a continuity between past and present, but a question of rupturing um, and an argument that in fact there's been a huge break between the past as we know it and the present, which is why people are trying to overcome it by constantly connecting to the past. Um, so Hartog says, for example, the past attracts more than history. The presence of the past, the evocation and the emotions win out over keeping a distance and mediation. Uh, he calls, this is also about heritage. Finally, this heritage is itself influenced by acceleration. It should be done quickly before it is too late before the night falls and today has completely disappeared. Now that is a rhetoric that I hear all the time because I do oral histories and they say, quick, we've got to get them before they die. Um, so there's a kind of interesting urgency about uh, this notion of um, trying to get people uh, to record their memories. Um, Stuart Hall and others have noted that in the light of the diminished capacity of the symbolic nation state to provide us with our, our central identities, that individuals are pushed to reconsider their identities and their frameworks. And they often, using this, recall ethnic heritage from other lands. And in fact, people are now saying that most of us um, are beginning to identify it with more than one country uh, um, in, across our lives. Um, given the tension and contradictions between transnational processes, which are everywhere, and the nation state, some say we are seeing the fragmentation of national memory. Now, this is an interesting question to those of, of us who did the survey, because the survey is carried out within the national frame. Um, but, um, and, and certainly much of the academic work in this field, memory studies, etc., etc., Pierre Aurard, is framed by specific, the specificity sorry, of national cultures. But it has also spanned investigation of differences between national cultures, as we will see in uh, the next two days. Now, I don't want to debate the demise or otherwise of nation states. There is at least a growing recognition that individuals are neither wholly nor exclusively divined, just, sorry, defined by the local or national cultures. In fact, people seem to find themselves in a world where power and responsibility feels increasingly dispersed. And we only have to refer to the GFC um, where the court to, to understand that, where the cause of events seems very uncertain. Where's the origin? Where did it happen? You know, we're experiencing this effect, but it didn't happen in our country. There's, you know, what, what, how did our economy contribute to this? Um, so we don't have the end of nations, of course. What we have is a decentering of them um, as the primary focus of cultural meaning. And I think that comes across in the surveys, because in one sense, we all now live transnationally. Okay, to the conclusion. In this talk, I've explored some of the complicated valencies of memory and history in public, whether within the profession and the public at large. The large scale social changes we have been experiencing affect how the past may be fashioned now for a wide array of purposes. Uh, pedagogical, aesthetic, uh, commercial, recreational, pleasurable, personal, etc., etc. But also, from which is the site, the, the site you didn't see from the American site, uh, propagandist and spectacle. This concerns not just historical knowledge in the stricter empirical and professional sense of the term, but also in our own surveys have shown how common sense ideas about history and the whole repertoire of official and everyday stories about a society's past. We know unequivocally now 
that history is not just something that happens in the academy. There are now, there are in addition, a whole range of articles and books and publications by an increasing number of very worried historians and their associations concerned with the future of the historical profession. Once we recognise that historical knowledge is a continuum, not a hierarchy, um, then historians have begun to feel somewhat threatened. For example, the American, um, Historia, American Historical Association, arguably the largest in North America, has in its statement on standards of professional con conduct a, a sentence which says we all participate in interpretation and narrating the past. The current president, Anthony Grafton, who's a wonderful historian, has written on footnotes and things, and, and others in, with him are urging historians to participate in public forums. And there are, this is also happening in, in a whole range of other areas. Urging historians to take a public role, um, to use your expertise outside the academy, to have involvement in public life, um, to mediate. Uh, Chakrabarti asked the question, how can historians mediate in debates about the past in India? Um, but some f are not worried. Some find it is not disturbing that our authority and control is being questioned or that it's lost. Some are finding it liberating. Um, the historian Ian Mortimer, who's an Englishman, says, if history is no longer defined in the ways it was, as a set of professional ob criteria, objectivity, etc., truth to be aimed at as an ideal, then it's empowering, he says. And I quote, historians are no longer merely the standard bearers of the legions of the dead. They are free to explore the past in ways that are not tedious or pedantic, but enjoyable and engaging from a public point of view as well as a scholarly one. I think he's being disingenuous but um, we can talk that, about that in discussion. This freedom, he argues, is the very essence of the difference between history as an institutionalised profession and all the other forms of studying the past. Um, he argues that many of the traditional constraints upon us as historians are lifted. Well, he obviously doesn't know anything about the um, university context. <laughs> to me, in some after the surveys, we can no longer argue about why and how history matters because we know from the surveys only too well that it matters to significant numbers of people. The question to ask now, it seems to me, is does the work of the professional historian still matter? And if so, how? Okay, thank you.